So just uh, as an example of the failure of technology, uh, I actually had a, a plan that we reduce the time of each speaker to six minutes, not seven <laughs> minutes, so we can gain five minutes for audience discussion. But the timers didn't want to cooperate, so everybody, of course, used the seven minutes, including myself, which is very bad. Uh, but we have a, uh, a little bit of time uh, to discuss a few questions that I have. Uh, one thing I wanted you to keep in mind uh, as we have the discussion, I have actually sort of a survey set of questions for you to think about. Um, have you identified use cases for AI and machine learning in your business? Uh, do they impact the bottom line? Does your organization create proof of concepts to get users feedback often? Are you using Agile? Uh, as we saw two of our speakers uh, mention. Do you have an AI champion in your organization? Uh, do you have a culture of innovation? I don't know what you would say. Do you have a good change management process? Because you need that to make any changes. Uh, and does senior management believe in the AI potential? Um, so with that, those are generic questions for you to think about. I prepared some questions for our speakers and I definitely want to take questions from the floor uh, if, if we have time, and I think, I think we will. Uh, let me start with the, first, uh, with the first question. Actually, I want to play on two themes that were brought up by our speakers. And maybe I'll start with uh, Sayed, I guess, at first, but a question directed to everybody. Um, you talked about you're going to make a change, and you have a choice of building on top of existing systems on legacy, or starting anew. And I think, Sayed, you mentioned something where you decided to rip it all apart and start from scratch. Uh, can, you, can you tell us something about this? Is this, was it a good idea, bad idea, uh, you know, how much risk? And then I'd love to hear from the other speakers what they think. <coughs> yes, yeah, so, um, so as Osama mentioned, we had the opportunity to choose between building on top of our legacy systems, and so taking all of the baggage that comes with that, or starting from scratch. Um, and uh, coincidentally, Open Insights was the company that was uh, consulting with us, and we came to a decision that we wanted to build from scratch. Um, there was a lot of resistance internally. The, the technical team was saying that you have everything you need. Um, the marketing team and the business team were saying we have nothing that we need. Um, so we came to that decision that we needed to uh, start from scratch. We did. And um, one thing that we found is once the... the the foundation was in place, we were able to accelerate very fast. Um, and two, it was, it was cheaper because we used, uh, we used open source technologies, which are uh, approximately 10x cheaper than going with the Oracle license and so on that we had at the time, or that we have still. So definitely, was, it was from our perspective, from my perspective, it was the right decision to make. Um, and it's a bearing fruit for us. Any, any other comments by anybody else? Yeah, sort can, of build on legacy versus start from scratch. Yeah, I can, I can tell a little bit from, from energy side. I mean, um, if we have the, the option to choose what we want to do in the best case, then we would also go for a fresh start. We, we call it greenfield usually because uh, it's just uh, leaner than you would, you would do it with legacy. But uh, sometimes you just uh, can change uh, some of these systems. You know? um, as one example, if, if the big corporation having 20 million customers um, is supposed to change the core system itself, um, then we're talking about moving 20 million customers from SAP to another system. And that's just not done like this. You know? So whenever we do new stuff, uh, it's about new technology, I think. Um, otherwise, we try to shift. Paco? Well, the technology is a must to, to do what you want to do. And in the digital world, in, 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 in predictive <coughs> modeling, everything you do needs technology. You need to be honest with yourself and your organization. If your core system and technology, your legacy, is not capable to meet what you need in order to offer it to your customers, you need to start from scratch. But that's a very honest and very rude question you need to make yourself. In our case, we believe that we could build on our core system all what we needed and we did, meaning connectivity, meaning everything that you need for the new world to, be, to work. But that's a very, very, very difficult decision. In, in Vodafone, we decided, at least in Vodafone Italy, we went for the full stack replacement, which is happening as we speak, so I can't tell you if it's a good idea or not. <laughs> um, in previous lives, we, we have done that in other big companies, and in the end, it works, but it's tough. As for data, we, 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 we have a standalone, separate big data platform that is a group platform. 
Um, so it's the moment that it got up, up and running, it's pretty easy for us to get the data in and, and start doing analytics. In any case, analytics and intelligence should be always kind of decoupled from from what the, the corporational IT is doing. I think, I think you can always do good analytics with whatever data you have. You just need to make sure that you, 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 you look at the quality of it. But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, my experience, d data is, uh, is so new to most companies that what you think is legacy, what you think is working, is probably not. Uh, I have spent time you know, at many big institutions where I wasted a lot of time trying to fix the legacy. So, that's why I'm a fan of uh, <coughs> building new, especially with the huge developments in the field. Um, another question for everyone. So usually digitization is driven by efficiency, the need to make the business faster, uh, etc. And I often find myself wondering, why, why is this? I mean, for marketing departments, if I were a CMO, uh, I'd be thinking about, wow, this opens up a whole new set of channels. Uh, I could use things like AI chatbots to create real dialogues that could be one-on-one. -on -one. I could uh, create a whole new way of scaling my business. Uh, I would ask you guys, why, why do you see it happening out of the marketing department anytime, or is it normally being driven by technology or the CEO, etc.? Maybe we start with Paco, but we go through it, you know, whoever. I'm talking about, about my, my, my own case. We, we need marketing and sales goes together. That's why it, how we organize the company is that mark, the sales and marketing goes together in the same position. So it is a head of sales and marketing because we need desperately both. So it depends how you organize, you can get that. But probably answering your question, it's pretty much the mindset of your marketing team. Yes, my sales and marketing is more marketing, more sales. It's 50-50 more or less, but you need to have the people, the talent, the competence, the core competence to, to really develop the marketing uh, that drives all the what we are discussing now. From my point of view, it's um, <coughs> the CMO has definitely um, the role to drive it forward. Um, but he's not on his own. I mean, there are other apartments around him that he need to work with in order to get it done. Uh, for example, if we're talking about technology, it's, it's also the IT he needs to involve, at least from our point of view. Um, a lot of technology and data sits within IT at Energy. Um, that's one piece. And the other piece is, um, is the CMO today, or all of the CMO, CMOs, are they um, skilled up enough to understand what possibilities are out there with the technology or not? Um, and I think sometimes they are not. Um, and I think they need someone on the side, something like a, um, a, a new chief technology officer or a chief data officer that, that, that completes the picture for him and then those two together drive, uh, drive the innovation and move it forward. I think that definitely it cannot be led by technology alone. Um, but on the other hand, we need, and we see it now happening in the markets, the new marketeers that are more data savvy, have a have a, don't have a repulsion, at least, for technology, um, are, are the right profiles to actually connect with the things that we produce. Uh, it's not just uh, one or the other. Yeah, I mean, I would agree, I would agree with that. A lot, of the, um, um, a lot of the marketing profiles that we have uh, within, our, within our organization and previous ones, and with my experience, are heavily geared towards maybe brand and sales and marketing, whereas um, using this, uh, using data to to positively impact these KPIs is not as well understood. And maybe because of that, there's not that uh, proactive um, adoption or push uh, for, this, uh, for this stuff. And so invariably, it comes from a different side of the business. Um, and uh, so what you need is you need a conduit between, <coughs> between uh, the departments um, to, uh, to make this work. And if you have a, a CDO type of function, then that's, that seems to be the most logical and sensible way to move forward if you really want to do this seriously. By the way, any questions in the audience? I definitely would love to take questions from the audience. I have plenty more here for, for our panel, but if you have questions, uh, I, you know, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll prioritize audience questions. I know it's still morning, but by now you woke up. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't see any hands. There's one. There's one here. Oh, there's one. Okay, <laughs> can you... <clears throat> 
You mentioned earlier about the challenges around getting submerged in a data lake. What are your best strategies? I'd like to hear from the panel about what your best strategy is about avoiding drowning in a data lake is. Yeah, how do we avoid drowning in the data lake and how do we avoid the data lake turning into a toxic swamp, as I call it? Yeah. Any ideas? Yeah, I can go first with this. Um, inevitably, when, when, you, when you create these things, and I'm talking about a telecommunications company where we, we, we input two terabytes of metadata, uh, metadata alone every day, the platform has already got like 36 petabytes or something like that. Um, so you're bound to be kind of swimming in a little bit of um, swampy water. But the truth is that um, we have a process by which e every time we input something, we identify the potential use this has. So we are immediately channeling it through to um, a team that's working on it. Um, uh, but yeah, it is a bit of a challenge because this also lives with the existing um, data, more, more structured data warehouses and so on. Uh, and it is a big thing because you, you, will, you will lose lots of opportunities if you don't, don't put some, some tidiness and governance in it. Yes, but it does happen. Yes, it does happen. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I, I'm a big fan of, of approaching it case by case and, and thereby you make sure you have the right data in place, you have the quality in place you need. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, so what we did is we, we very consciously um, made sure that the representation of the data was always via subject areas. So we would bring the information into a data lake, but then we would represent it or present it to the business within subject areas, like I was mentioning, whether it be a customer subject area or a billing subject area or a traffic subject area. So that we keep, so that we, we tighten rules around it, quality is there, um, and that the end user has a, a use for it rather than just dumping it in a data lake and then figuring what we do with it, with it then. So we have, a, we have a predefined use for it um, post the data lake. Yeah, and um, uh, look, I'm, I'm super passionate about this topic in particular because so many companies get themselves in so much trouble with this data lake stuff. By the way, the tech companies, including Google, Amazon, many of the big Microsoft, went through this problem, you know, the data swamp issue and having to throw away a whole bunch of data about 15 years ago. So they learned very hard lessons. Uh, I think the key to avoiding it, and it's a strong key, and, and this is why I'm, I'm a believer in, in centralizing the data and putting it in a place where you have people who worry about it all the time, is that governance bit. Somebody who's, who makes sure you're not replicating attributes, somebody who makes sure as you add a new requirement, it's needed and it's approached the right way. It's sustained, it's deleted uh, after it's not needed anymore, which now is creating a whole bunch of uh, 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 GDPR issues and so forth for many companies. Uh, so it's a big deal to have that dedicated center of excellence that, that looks at the deal. I'd like to ask each of you, any other questions from the audience? That was a great question, by the way. All right, I'll, uh, I'll, ask, uh, I'll ask my question. Um, what are your highest marketing-related priorities? Is there a place for AI, ML in them, and, and how do you deal with the lack of talent? So I don't know who wants to start. Maybe, Paco, I will address that to you. Marketing priorities, highest. Two. <laughs> One is to do the onboarding at the merchant point of sell, to do that much easier, right, than asking for even, even easier than we do. Can we do um, quicker? Can we do easier? Um, and the second one is we need to introduce, we are in the way, but we are still are far away from having uh, predictive modeling well, well matured in the company. So we can use that for... 20 projects, and we are barely one, two. So we need to exhaust all what modeling can do for us on machine learning. So, yeah. um, so I would say one of our, the biggest uh, priority that we have is, is moving customers from uh, feature phone handsets to smartphones, because that's a, an automatic increase of approximately two, two and a half times a customer's revenue. Um, so that's something that is critical because of the huge amount of investment that's been made in the networks for us to facilitate data usage and streaming and so on. Uh, that's one. And then the second thing would be uh, to arrest and to reduce churn, which is, uh, which is a huge issue for uh, most operators, especially prepaid market operators. I mean, a, a, approximately 30 to 40 percent of customers churn out every year. So just to keep your base stable, you need to acquire the same 30 percent again. 
So those two, I would say, are the, the core uh, issues that marketing has. Daniel? Depending on the markets, we're, we're very rapidly shifting from, say, gross ads and, and, uh, and high commercial activity to what we call uh, um, e-care, um, caring about the customer journeys, because that's what, what will keep our business going for longer. As for AI, um, we do, well, machine learning we do all, all across, but, but the, um, the AI is only in a few applications for the moment, like last mile adjustment of offers and so on, but there will be more and more as, as, as the more we do uh, more journeys. And finally, as for talent, yeah, it's a big, this, is a, this is a tough one. We are hiring very actively, by the way, um, but um, we have realized that we, we, we have uh, I, I just made an agreement with the um, uh, association in Silicon Valley where we're going to train people to become data scientists in the company. So we're going to create a generation of, uh, of uh, data scientists in our own organization. By the way, I need to say something. I think there is a paradox that we're living through right now with this data science um, activity. We are, with technology is supposed to be allow more, less qualified people to do things that were only meant for specialists before. In the data science space, we're kind of witnessing the contrary for some reason. Um, and paradoxes don't exist. So this, this will, um, I think the solution to that is what I said before, that the people we work with, the marketeers, have a slightly different profile. So they can be producers of insights uh, just as much. Uh, many of the insights that we do today will be produced by the, 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 the market marketeers. Max, any comments? <clears throat> yes, I mean, our priorities are um, getting a 360 view of our customer in place and that everywhere in all our um, opcos that we have, and, and there are too many of them, um, that's, that's the first priority. The second one is then automation and personalization, a bit going back to your kind of journeys. Um, how do we communicate with customers um, as automated as possible while giving them relevant information? Um, and on the, the talent side, um, we, we have a couple of approaches. One is really um, in-housing some of the work that agencies used to be doing. So we have a kind of a small in-house agency now, uh, which is quite exciting to see whether they can output higher quality, which some people are expecting, um, but can they do that at the same cost? So an interesting um, example. And the second one is also within our strategy consultancy, we're now building up special expertise around data, around UX, CX, uh, process robotization, uh, quite exciting times also to transform uh, consultancies. Okay. I think we, we ran out of time. I was going to ask each of you to do a 10-second advice to the audience uh, in parting, but I think we're running out of time. So please join me in thanking our speakers for a great session.